final presentation this day. It has not been a sprint. It has been a marathon. But we're not finished because tomorrow we have, I believe, five more presentations. The title of our study this evening is Three Perspectives of the Last Three Plagues. We're going to deal with events after the close of probation. But before we do, we want to ask for the Lord's presence, so please bow your heads reverently as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne with humility, realizing that our wisdom and our knowledge is very limited, especially because we live in a world of sin with sinful, corrupt bodies. But at the same time, we come boldly to the throne of grace because we know we can get wisdom from you. And so we ask that you will be with us through the presence of your Spirit to enlighten our minds, to open our hearts, and to prepare us for the great events which will soon take place in this world. Thank you for the privilege of prayer and for answering us, for we ask it in the precious and most powerful name of Jesus. Amen. The book of Revelation describes seven devastating plagues that will afflict the earth after the close of human probation. The plagues are described in Revelation chapter 16. In this study we're going to look primarily, primarily at the last three plagues of Revelation chapter 16. However, I need to review very briefly the content of the first four plagues. Now, the three perspectives are the perspective of Revelation, the perspective of the book of Exodus, and the perspective of the spirit of prophecy. We're going to deal very briefly with the perspective of the book of Revelation. That's a whole topic in itself. We're going to focus on the perspective of the book of Exodus and the perspective of Ellen White, the spirit of prophecy. So let me just review very briefly the outstanding points of the plagues in the book of Revelation. The first four plagues are what I call jeopardy plagues, because during the first four plagues the lives of God's people are in danger of being wiped out. In other words, during the first four plagues the anger of the wicked against God's people grows. That's the first four plagues, and the first four plagues are sores on the body of those who are in apostasy, the sea is turned into blood, the rivers are turned into blood, and the sun scorches all of the vegetation. And for each one that falls, the wicked become more and more angry with God's people. When it looks like the wicked are going to destroy God's people, then you have the fifth plague. The fifth plague is a plague of darkness. Darkness upon the kingdom of the beast, the last ruling power on this earth before the coming of Jesus. In other words, darkness covers the entire earth under the fifth plague. The sixth plague is the drying up of the river Euphrates. This is not a literal river. In order to understand this, we have to go to Revelation chapter 17, where the harlot, an apostate church, is seated on many waters, and her name is Babylon. So we know that the river she's seated on is the Euphrates River. So we're not talking here about the drying up of the literal river Euphrates over in Iraq. It means that the waters that the harlot sits on, which are multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, are going to dry up on her. And then in the seventh plague, we have noises, an earthquake such as never have been seen, thunder, lightning, horrific precipitation, islands and mountain ranges, ranges disappear. So we're going to take a look at this very brief description of the plagues of the book of Revelation from two perspectives. The first perspective, the exodus of Israel from Egypt, and the second perspective, Ellen White's perspective in the book The Great Controversy. Now we know that there's a connection between the story of the Exodus and the final deliverance of God's people at the seventh plague. You say, how do we know that? It's very simple. After Israel was delivered from Egypt, the Egyptians were buried in the Red Sea, we find in Exodus 15 that they sang the Song of Moses. Moses. 
The book of Revelation tells us that the 144,000 living saints, those who go through the time of trouble, when they are delivered, they will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. So we know that there's a connection between Israel who, uh, who sang the song of Moses in Exodus and the final deliverance of the 144,000 that will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb at the end of time. So let's take a look at the story of the Exodus and then we're going to apply it to the end time. As probably most of you know, Israel was in bondage in Egypt. Now I'm only going to give you the biblical references, we don't have time to read them all. That's Exodus 2 verses 23 to 25. Israel was in bondage to the head of Egypt who is called the great dragon in Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3. They were enslaved and God promised because they cried out to Him to deliver them according to Exodus chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8. In order for God to fulfill His purpose and to keep His promise of delivering Israel from Egypt, He sent plagues upon Egypt and the purpose was to encourage Pharaoh to let his people go so his people could come out of Egypt. In other words, each plague had the purpose of God saying, let my people go. You can find that in Exodus 8, 1 as well as other verses early in the book of Exodus. Each plague, God says, I'm sending these plagues because you have my people enslaved, let my people go. But what happens is that with each plague, the rage of Pharaoh against God's people actually grows. Now it's interesting to notice that uh, Israel tried to observe the Sabbath in Egypt, but the Bible tells us that their desire to observe the Sabbath caused greater oppression and greater suffering for them because Pharaoh did not like the idea of them resting on the Sabbath. You say, where do we find that? Well, let's notice in our Bibles, Exodus chapter 5 and verses 4 and 5. Then the king of Egypt said to them, that is to Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Because Moses had said, let us go out into the wilderness for three days, because he's saying we want to travel today, keep the Sabbath, and then come back. So Moses and Aaron, uh, he says to Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them Shabbat from their labor. Interesting that the word Shabbat is used there. Ellen White understood this. In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 258, Ellen White wrote, In their bondage, the Israelites had to some extent lost the knowledge of God's law, and they had departed from its precepts. The Sabbath had been generally disregarded, and the exactions of their taskmasters made its observance apparently impossible. But Moses had shown his people that obedience to God was the first condition of deliverance, and the efforts made to restore the observance of the Sabbath had come to the notice of their oppressors. In fact, Ellen White's comment comes immediately after the, the text that I read in Exodus 5, 4 and 5, the observance of the Sabbath made their life more difficult. And then of course, at the tenth plague, Pharaoh finally relents and allows God's people to go. However, the story doesn't end there. Pharaoh then repents of letting the people go. And so he's going to make one last attempt to recover the subjects that he lost. The people must submit to my authority, is what Pharaoh said, or be killed. And the Bible tells us that Pharaoh hedged the Israelites in till there was no escape. The people feared the armies of Pharaoh, according to the story. They feared that Pharaoh would kill them. We know this because they complained that Moses had taken them out into the wilderness to perish, Exodus 14 verse 12. And so Israel is caught there next to the Gulf of Aqaba. It's not the little sea of reeds as uh, some scholars say, well it was just a marsh, that's why they were able to cross. No, this is at the Gulf of Aqaba. 
extremely deep, and they're caught there. In Exodus chapter 14 and uh, verse 3, we find what Pharaoh thinks about the situation of the people. It says there, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land, the wilderness has closed them in. Ellen White amplifies what Pharaoh meant when he said that Israel was bewildered by the land and the wilderness had closed them in. They were going to be easy prey. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 283 and 284, Ellen White explains, The Hebrews were encamped beside the sea, whose waters presented a seemingly impassable barrier before them, while on the south a rugged mountain obstructed their further progress. They were caught, so to speak, between a rock and a hard place. There was no hope of escape. There was no, no hope of deliverance. So Pharaoh now begins to prepare for battle. He takes 600 of his choice chariots saying, I am going to recover those people for myself. I'm going to lead them into apostasy against their God or else they're going to be killed. Notice Exodus chapter 14 and verses 5 through 9. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. Notice, the wrath of Pharaoh is against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea beside Pi, Ha-Hiroth before bel Sephon. And so now Israel is going to go through a severe time of trouble where they are going to cry out to the Lord for deliverance. We find in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 10 a description of that time of trouble that they were in because they've left Egypt, but now Egypt wants to recover them, and if they don't want to submit, they will be killed. In Exodus 14, 10, we find these words, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. What was God's response to Israel? Israel had no weapons. They had no horses. They had no chariots. They had no way to defend themselves. In themselves, they were doomed to perish. But the battle was not Israel's. The battle was the battle of the great God Almighty. All Israel had to do was trust in the Lord, not follow what their eyes and ears and their feelings said, but what God said He had promised to deliver them. Notice Exodus chapter 14 and verses 13 and 14. When the people cry out because they're fearful, we find these words. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. Notice, the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. In the time of trouble, God says, don't worry, this is not your battle, this is the battle of the great God Almighty. Sounds similar to Revelation chapter 16, where Armageddon is spoken about as the battle of the Lord God Almighty. So we find God promising to deliver Israel through His power. But there was a problem. The Red Sea was an impassable obstacle. The people could not be delivered while the waters of the Red Sea were united. The waters had to be divided or dried up in order for them to be delivered. 
Now we need to understand this relationship between God and his people in terms of the covenant. You see, Israel was in a covenant relationship with the Lord. Let me give you four illustrations so that we understand that when Pharaoh was fighting the people, he was really fighting the Lord of the people. In antiquity, a great king many times made a covenant with lesser kings. The lesser kings promised obedience to the greater king, and the greater king promised protection for the lesser king. That was a covenant. We are lesser kings, and Jesus is the king of kings. So if an enemy came against the lesser king, he was messing really with the greater king, and the greater king intervened to deliver the lesser king because he was in a covenant with the greater king. We also have this, the illustration of the shepherd and his sheep. David is a prime example. What happened when a bear or a lion came against the sheep of David? David says, oh, I'm out of here. No, he didn't. He took it personally. To touch one of, one of a David's sheep was to, to deal with him. He would rise up and he would kill the bear and he would kill the lion to protect his sheep. Another illustration is that Jesus is the husband and the church is his wife. What would you do if somebody was beating up on your wife? Would that be beating up on you? Yes, because the Bible says that we're one flesh. Jesus and his church, spiritually speaking, are one flesh. The Bible says that Jesus is the head and the church is the body. Whoever touches the body actually touches the head. In fact, the head is that which feels like when you prick a finger with a needle, it's really your head that is feeling it. So, as Pharaoh was fighting against the people, he was fighting against the God of the people. Ellen White wrote in volume 7 of the Testimonies, page 182, the following words. As we approach the last crisis, it is a vital moment that harmony and unity exist among the Lord's instrumentalities. The world is filled with storm and war and variance. Yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God, now listen carefully, to oppose God in the person of his witnesses. So in fighting the people of God, they are fighting the God of the people. And so now, here come the 600 chariots and all of the armies of Egypt, the people are caught next to the Red Sea, and suddenly a plague of darkness falls. That's the fifth plague of the book of Revelation. Let's read about it in Exodus chapter 14 and verses 19 and 20. Exodus 14 verses 19 and 20. It says there, And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. In other words, the pillar of cloud was in front of them, moved over their heads, and stood between them and the Egyptians. Verse 20, So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud, now listen carefully, it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. So notice, a plague of darkness upon the Egyptians, but the God's people at the same time were in glorious light. What was the fifth plague of Revelation? A plague of darkness. Is it possible that God's people are going to be in the light when the darkness falls in the book of Revelation? Absolutely. Let me read Patriarchs and Prophets 286 and 287 where Ellen White describes this wall of darkness that separated the Egyptians from Israel. This is what she wrote, but now as the Egyptian host approached them expecting to make them an easy prey, the cloudy column rose majestically into the heavens, passed over the Israelites, and descended between them and the armies of Egypt. A wall of darkness interposed between the pursued and their pursuers. The Egyptians could no longer discern the camp of the Hebrews and were forced to halt. In other words, they were arrested. And then Ellen White finishes the statement by writing, but as the darkness of night deepened, that is for the Egyptians, the wall of cloud became a great light 
to the Hebrews, flooding the entire encampment with the radiance of the day. So there you have the equivalent of the plague of darkness, the fifth plague in the book of Revelation. What about the sixth plague? The sixth plague is the drying up of the waters of the Euphrates, not the literal Euphrates. The harlot, the apostate religious system, sits on multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. She rules over them, and they do her bidding. As long as they are united with her, God's people are in jeopardy. But what's going to happen with those waters of the spiritual Euphrates? They are going to dry up on the harlot. Let me ask you, the story of the Exodus, was there a drying up to, pre uh, to give a way of escape for God's people? Absolutely. You see, the Bible tells us that Moses extended his rod. By the way, the rod represents the voice of God. God will destroy the wicked with the rod of his mouth. So it's symbolic of the voice of God. So Moses extended his rod, and the waters of the Red Sea dried up or were divided. Two key words. They dried up and they were divided to prepare the way of escape for God's people. Up to this point, the waters were united, and they were a menace to God's people. As long as the waters were united, they helped the Egyptians, and there was no escape. Notice Exodus 14, verse 16 and verse 21, where the two key words are used, divided and united. By the way, we find these in Revelation, in, in Revelation chapter 16. We also find them in Revelation 13. I don't have time to go into that right now, but let's read Exodus 14, verse 16. God says to Moses, But lift up your rod, and stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. Notice the word, divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground. So the waters are dried up, the waters are divided. She continues, uh, and actually um, Moses continues writing, verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. Interesting. The waters were divided, or the waters dried up. And now God takes the battlefield. As the sun was about to rise is when God took the battlefield. Suddenly confusion and a panic came among the Egyptians, and the objects of their rage were forgotten. And now they turn around, and they begin to flee, because God has intervened. It is the battle of the Lord God Almighty. Let's read about it in Exodus 14, verses 24 and 25. Now it came to pass in the morning watch, that is when the sun is, was about to come up, that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled, so notice there's going to be confusion among the Egyptians, he troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel. Now notice this, don't miss it. Let us free, flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights against them, for them against the Egyptians. This is the battle of the Lord God Almighty. Let's notice Exodus chapter 14 and read verses 25 to verse 31. All this passage together. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. Now don't miss this point. First of all, the waters are divided or the waters dry up. But then the waters are going to avalanche themselves against the enemies of God's people. The sea will now become inimical to the Egyptians and friendly to Israel. So notice once again verse 25, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, and on their chariots, and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, notice it's at the sun rising that deliverance comes. It says, When the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. 
So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters dry up and then the waters drown the Egyptians. Verse 28, then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the armies of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Are you starting to catch an interesting picture? Darkness for the Egyptians, light for God's people, then the waters of the Red Sea dry up, they're divided, and then the waters drown the enemies of God's people. And then you have the seventh plague. Do you remember what the seventh plague was? An earthquake, lightning, thunder, noises. You say, well that's not in Exodus chapter 14 and 15. True, but it is in the book of Psalms. Go with me to Psalms 77 and we'll read verses 15 through 20. Psalms 77, 15 to 20. These are the phenomena of the seventh plague. It says there, uh, it's, uh, the psalmist is speaking about God delivering his people there at the edge of the Red Sea. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you, they were afraid. The depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water. Notice precipitation, just like in the seventh plague. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. That's thunder. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. This is what happens under the seventh plague, folks. Verse 19, you say, how do we know this is dealing with what happened to Israel at the edge of the Red Sea? Verse 19, your way was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Are you catching the picture? This is righteousness by faith. This is trust in the Lord. Usually we think righteousness by faith is spiritual deliverance from sin. It most certainly is. But also those who have a relationship with the Lord will literally be delivered from literal death during the time of trouble. And Exodus 14 verse 28 tells us, Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, not so much as one of them remained. And then what did the people do? They sang the song of Moses. Now the book of Revelation says that only the 144,000 can sing that song. We need to understand what that means. It doesn't mean that others are not going to be able to understand the words or even sing the words. What it means is that the 144,000 are the only ones that can sing it with the utmost enthusiasm because it's the song of their experience. Let me ask you, do you suppose that somebody could put music to the lyrics of Exodus chapter 15? And we could sing that song uh, in Exodus 15 with the music of the composer? Of course we could. Could we sing it the same way that Israel did after they crossed the Red Sea and their enemies were buried in the waters? I don't think so. Let's read the song of Moses in Exodus 15, 1 through 18. It's a long passage, but it's powerful. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its riders he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captives, captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. 
Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You in your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy mountain. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will, ta will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab trembling will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone till your peoples pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased. What a fantastic hymn. What a fantastic song. The song of Moses is the song of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. But then I want you to notice in Exodus 15 that God then takes his people to his holy mountain, which is Zion. Where are the 144,000 standing in the book of Revelation? They are standing on Mount Zion, Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5. So we find in Exodus 15, 17 and 18, that God, after delivering his people, takes them to his tabernacle, to Mount Zion. It says there, you will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. That's Zion, by the way. In the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Now we need to examine a very important biblical principle of interpretation. And it's this. Literal Israel was literally captive in literal Egypt to literal Pharaoh. God raised up a little literal person to lead his literal people out of Egypt. Literal Israel was literally closed in at the edge of the literal Red Sea. The literal waters were divided or dried up by Moses' literal rod, and then the waters literally avalanched themselves upon the enemies to deliver literal Israel. Literal Israel then sang the song of their deliverance, and God took them to the literal mountain of God's inheritance, the earthly Mount Zion. Now, why do you say, why are you emphasizing the word literal, literal, literal? Folks, because what happened literally to Israel is a type of what is going to happen with God's people on a global scale, God's spiritual Israel all over the world. So this is the uh, exposition on the last three plagues as they apply to the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. But now let's take a look at the writings of Ellen G. White. You know, it is common for Ellen White to refer to biblical events without actually quoting the verses that describe those events. In the great controversy, Ellen White does not quote, listen carefully, Ellen White does not quote the verses that describe the fifth and sixth plague. She never quotes those verses in the, in the book, Good Great Controversy. And so people say, well, Ellen White didn't have anything to say about the fifth and sixth plague and the seventh plague. It's true that Ellen White does not quote the verses, but don't think that because he doesn't quote the verses of the fifth and sixth plague that she doesn't have anything to say about them. What we need to do when we study the writings of Ellen White is look at the structure, the sequence of events. She might not quote the verses, but if we look at the sequence, we'll know that she's commenting on the verses that she doesn't quote. Let me give you a couple of examples. 
I did a series on the 24 elders, actually it was an entire series on the seals, the first part of it was on the 24 elders. And we studied Revelation 4 and 5. You know, when you read those chapters you find that there's one who is seated on a throne. He's not identified who it is. Someone is seated on the throne. There's four living creatures that are in the midst of the throne. There are 24 elders around the throne. There are seven lamps of fire before the throne. And there is a lamb as though he had been slain. All of these are symbols. One seated on the throne is a symbol. Four living creatures is a symbol. Twenty-four elders is a symbol. Seven lamps of fire symbolizes the Holy Spirit. The lamb represents Christ. Ellen White does not actually quote these verses, but she interprets them in uh, the book Desire of Ages, page 833 to 835. So don't think that because Ellen White doesn't quote these verses, we don't know who the 24 elders are and who the four living creatures are and who the Lamb is because Ellen White doesn't use the terminology, but she interprets the terminology. If you read those pages in Desire of Ages, she identifies the one seated on the throne as God the Father. She identifies the four living creatures as cherubim and seraphim. She identifies the 24 elders as the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. She identifies the seven lamps of fire as symbolizing the Holy Spirit. And she, she says that the lamb as though he had been slain represents Jesus Christ. So she doesn't quote the verses, but clearly this is her commentary on Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. The same thing happens with Daniel 11. Ellen White never quotes any verse from Daniel 11, 40 to 45. So many people today say Ellen White had nothing to say about the last few verses of Daniel chapter 11 because she never quotes the verses. She never even uses the terminology, so people assume she had nothing to say. Now I don't have time to amplify this, however if you're interested uh, you can uh, go to a document that I wrote, um, the, my new notes on Daniel 11 are going to come out very very soon, and there I deal with this particular section of the book of Daniel. I show that Ellen White had very much to say about these verses even though she never quotes them. So with this principle in mind, let's notice how Ellen White interprets the sixth and seventh plagues along with the fifth plague. She never quotes the verses that describe the fifth and sixth plagues in the great controversy, but she does quote the seventh plague, verses that are co connected with the seventh plague. So what we have to do is notice where she quotes the verses that deal with the seventh plague and then work backwards to find what she has to say about plague number five and plague number six. So let's uh, do a little detective work. Great Controversy 627 and 628, notice the page numbers, Ellen White describes the first four plagues. So in Great Controversy 627 and 628, the chapter on the time of trouble, Ellen White uh, quotes the verses that have to do with the first four plagues. That's a, those are jeopardy plagues, where the wicked are getting angrier and angrier and anxious to destroy God's people. Then on page 635 and 636, Ellen White describes the last three plagues. And then on page 648, she describes the song that the 144,000 sing, the song of Moses and the Lamb. So now I'm going to go to Great Controversy, page 635. And I'm going to read uh, the first part of uh, these pages, and I'm going to add some interpretation as we go along in the light of what we studied regarding the Exodus. Notice what she wrote. When the protection of human laws shall be withdrawn from those who honor the law of God, there will be in different lands a simultaneous movement for their destruction. It sounds like Pharaoh with his armies coming against God's people. She continues, as the time appointed in the decree, that is the death decree, draws near, the people will conspire to root out the hated sect, just like happened with Pharaoh and Israel. It will be determined to strike in one night a decisive blow which shall utterly silence the voice of dissent and reproof. The people of God, 
some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats in the forest and the mountains, still plead for divine protection, just like Israel at the edge of the Red Sea. While in every quarter, companies of armed men, these are the Egyptian armies, the equivalent, urged on by hosts of evil angels, are preparing for the work of death. Israel at the edge of the Red Sea and the armies ready to annihilate them. And now notice Ellen White's terminology. It is now, in the hour of utmost extremity, that the God of Israel, notice how, God, how Ellen White calls the Deliverer, that the God of Israel will interpose for the deliverance of His chosen, just as happened at the edge of the Red Sea. Now notice, with shouts of triumph, jeering and imprecation, throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey. What is it that rushes, folks? It's waters that rush. And so Ellen White is describing here plague number, uh, number six. The waters are all ready to serve as an obstacle against God's people. So with shouts of triumph, jeering and imprecation, throngs of evil men are about to rush upon their prey. And now comes the fifth plague. When lo, a dense blackness, deeper than the darkness of the night, falls upon the earth. That's the darkness of the fifth plague. Then a, but, but notice, darkness for the wicked. She continues, then a rainbow, shining with the glory from the throne of God, spans the heavens and seems to encircle each praying company. Darkness for the wicked and for the righteous, light just like at the edge of the Red Sea. And now notice, this is the sixth plague. Remember, the waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. Now comes plague number six. The angry multitudes, what? are suddenly arrested. What happens to the waters that are about to drown God's people? They are suddenly what? They are suddenly arrested. Was the anger of the Egyptians against God's people arrested when the waters dried up and God was fighting for Israel? Yes. So once again, the angry multitudes are suddenly arrested. Their mocking cries die away. The objects of their murderous rage are forgotten. Did the Egyptians forget their, that they wanted to destroy Israel when the chariot wheels started falling off? Absolutely. She continues, with fearful forebodings, they gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant. See, God has a covenant with His people, a covenant of protection. With fearful forebodings, they gaze upon the symbol of God's covenant and long to be shielded from its overpowering brightness. In the next chapter, you remember that then the waters drowned uh, the, the Egyptians? What are the waters going to do that withdraw their support from the harlot? They are then going to turn on the religious leaders and drown them, symbolically speaking. In the very next chapter, which is the chapter of the desolation of the earth, Ellen White amplifies this moment of the sixth plague. I'm going to read now from Great Controversy 655 and 656. This is when the people realize that they've been deluded by their religious leaders, by the harlot and by the daughters of the harlot. The people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. It's a serious thing to be a preacher. It's a very serious thing to be a preacher. No fun and games. Don't just entertain people. We're living in a time where prophecy is being fulfilled. People need to be warned. People need to prepare for what's coming. So she continues, Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. Now the waters are going to turn on them. She says, the multitudes, remember the waters represent multitudes, the multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin, and they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. See, they're going to turn against them. 
The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for the destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. A little bit later on on page 657, Ellen White wrote this. She's going to quote Zechariah 14, 12, and 13, and this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem, that is against God's people at the end time. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth, because they've used it to teach lies. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. They're going to be confused, in other words. And they shall lay hold everyone on the hand of his neighbor, and on his hand shall rise, and his hand shall rise against the hand of his neighbor. They will fight among themselves. Then she continues, in the mad strife of their own fierce passions, and by the awful outpouring of God's unmingled wrath, fall the wicked inhabitants of the earth, priests, rulers, and people, rich and poor, high and low. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. And you know what's interesting? Ellen White describes the fifth plague, darkness and light for God's people. Then she speaks about the multitudes, the waters being arrested, they dry up or they're divided. Babylon is divided into three parts according to Revelation 16 and verse 19. And then the waters avalanche themselves upon the religious leaders who have deceived them. And then Ellen White quotes the verses that deal with the seventh plague. So we know by working backwards from the seventh plague backwards, we know that she's commenting on plague number five and number six right before that. Notice on page 636 and 637, the very next pages, Ellen White uh, wrote, in the midst of the angry heavens is one clear space of indescribable glory, whence comes the voice of God like the sound of many waters saying, it is done. Revelation 16, 17, seventh plague. Then she continues, the voice, that voice shakes the heavens and the earth. There is a mighty earthquake. She's going to quote now the seventh plague such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. That's verses 17 and 18 that's describing the seventh plague. The firmament appears to open and shut. The glory from the throne of God seems flashing through. The mountains shake like a reed in the wind, and ragged rocks, rocks are scattered on every side. There is a roar as of a coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. There is heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon a mission of destruction. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundations seem to be giving away. Mountain chains are sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. That's what the seventh plague describes. The seaports that have become like Sodom for wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waters. Babylon the Great has come in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. Great hailstones, she's going to quote now the seventh plague again, great hailstones, everyone about the weight of a talent, that's about 50 pounds, are doing their work of destruction. Revelation 16, verse 19 and verse 21. Are you catching the picture, folks? Does Ellen White have anything to say about plague number five and plague number six? Of course she does. She never quotes the verses. So people say, well, she didn't have anything to say about the sixth plague, the drying up of the Euphrates. Yes, she does. But she doesn't quote the verses and she doesn't use the terminology. We have to do the work of the detective. We have to work by deduction. That is from here backwards, like a detective does. We need, in other words, not only simply to read and say, oh, Ellen White doesn't quote any verse, so she doesn't have anything to say about that. No, you know, the same is true about Daniel chapter 11. People get all hung up about Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Ellen White never quotes those verses. She never even uses the language of those verses. So they say she had nothing to say about those verses. Wait a minute. She does have a lot to say about Daniel 12 verse 1. The very next verse after verses 40 to 45. So where would you expect to find Ellen White's comments about verses 40 to 45? 
you have to begin at Daniel 12 verse 1 and you have to work backwards. And when you do that, you'll see that Ellen White has a lot to say about uh, verses 40 to 45. And then in Great Controversy 648 and 649, Ellen White describes the God's people singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Are you catching the sequence? Let me give you the pages again. Great Controversy 6, 27 and 28, the first four plagues. 6, 27, 6, 28. Great Controversy 6, 35 and 6, 36, the last three plagues. Great Controversy 6, 48, the song of the 144,000. In exact sequence, the way it appears in Revelation and the way in which it appears in the exodus of Israel from Egypt. Now, here is the most important question of all. The most important question vital to our own personal subsistence. What will determine whose side we are on in this great final battle? Here's a very interesting detail. If you look at a red letter edition of the New Testament, you're going to find that Jesus actually speaks through Revelation 3 verse 21. And then he doesn't speak again until Revelation 22 and verse 7. All the rest is narrative written, being written by John. But Jesus finishes speaking in Revelation chapter 3 verse 21, messages to the churches, and then he picks up and speaks again in Revelation 22 verse 7 with one exception. There's only one place where Jesus speaks between Revelation 3:21 and Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7, and that is Revelation 16 verse 15, which is inserted in the context of the sixth plague. It is a parenthesis in the sixth plague, and it gives you the secret of which side you're going to be on, whether you're on the Lord's side or whether you are on the enemy's side. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15, here Jesus speaks. Remember, he, sp he finished speaking, Revelation 3.21, speaks again in Revelation 22 and verse 7. This is the only time that Jesus speaks between those two points. What does Revelation 16 verse 15 have to say? Jesus speaks and says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. People misunderstand what they mean, what that means. They say, oh, the second coming is going to be like Jesus coming like a thief. No. The coming of Jesus like a thief is the close of probation. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, let me ask you. If everybody in the house is sleeping, and the thief comes at one o'clock in the morning and everybody's sleeping. Does anybody know that the thief has come? No. When do they find out that the thief has come? When they wake up the next morning, but then it's too late because the thief has come. Ellen White explains that probation will close and the world will be oblivious to the idea that probation has closed. Jesus comes as a thief. By the way, the closing of the door in the parable of the ten virgins is not the second coming of Christ. The closing of the door represents the close of probation, after which you have the time of trouble that we've described, followed by the second coming of Jesus Christ. The closing of the door, the, the, the foolish virgins, even after the closing of the door, have time to go and try and find oil. That's what happens during the time of trouble. They come back and say, let us in. No, sorry, probation is closed. Are you following me or not, folks? So when we say we need to prepare for the second coming, well, that's only a half truth. We need to prepare for the close of probation because if we're not prepared for the close of probation, we're not going to be prepared for the second coming of Christ. Now notice, behold, I am coming as a thief. What do we do because Jesus is going to close the door of probation? Blessed is he who watches. Is that in the parable of the ten virgins? Yes. What does that mean? It means to be awake. It means to be alert. It means to be aware of everything that's happening out there in the world. It means to be not drunk with false doctrine, but sober 
And so blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. By the way, these are the garments of sanctification, the garments of holiness. It's not God declaring us righteous. It is the righteousness that he develops in us. You say, how do you know that? It continues saying, and keeps his garments, lest he walk what? Lest he walk naked, and they see his what? And they see his shame. Do you know what other place in the book of Revelation you have very similar terminology? Now we say the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church, and I believe that 100%. But the Bible says that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the Laodicean Church, the lukewarm church. Do you know who is in the greatest danger of being found naked and their shame being revealed? It's not the world. It's Laodicea. You say, how do you know that? Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. After God says, you know, you think you're rich and increased with good and in need, goods and in need of nothing, and you think you're perfectly happy, you think you're perfectly clothed? Jesus gives counsel to the church. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. That's faith that works by love. That you may be rich. And white garments that you may be clothed. See, there's a connection with Revelation 16 verse 15 in white garments that you may be clothed, and now notice the connection, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. It is a special message to our beloved Seventh-day Adventist Church that we need to get ready. Let me mention one thing before I end. Revelation 16, 15 says we're supposed to watch because Jesus is coming as a thief. Probation is going to close. We need to keep our garments lest we walk na naked. Do you know every time the Bible uses the word walk in a symbolic sense, it's speaking about your conduct or your behavior? Walking naked means that you're, that you're practicing you have a conduct or a behavior that is in disharmony with the law of God. So Jesus, in this one verse inserted in the sixth plague, says when this time comes, make sure that you're watching, that you have kept your garments white, lest you walk naked and they see your shame. May the Lord help us to be among that remnant who will be faithful until the end.